Time out, stop the clock, and get your chance at, at the other end of the floor. So I really think that's one that Steve Fisher should have saved. You know what you want to do on defense more than they know what they want to do on offense. Well, you know one thing Kentucky would like to see happen right now. They'd like to get the hand, the ball into the hands of Travis Ford for a three-point try. And they bring Junior Brady in the game. We talked about this incredible confidence that Rick Pitino has in every member of his squad. Brady has not played one second of this game, and he comes on the floor now in this tight situation. And look out, Billy. He's wearing that number 23 that people <laughs> have talked about so much this week, and he's headed to the same goal that number 23 Michael, and number 23 Keith Smart, who made shots at the buzzer. Michigan tried to take a little time off the clock of Kentucky by picking up full court. And here's the solid screen for Ford. Needing a three to tie. They're switching all over out front. They're not wanting them to take the three. You notice this? They're letting everything go inside. Martinez. Rebound. Last touch by Michigan. Four Eight seconds. seconds to go. Now Kentucky has one timeout. Will they use it here? And Jim, there's why I said it wasn't a good idea for Michigan to call a timeout. See, they would have had no opportunity to stop the clock. They won't take their time out. Now, Weber has to be careful not to touch that ball across the line. <laughs> that would have been a technical foul. Michigan leads by three. They'll give them. They'll give them a two-point shot. That's all in by Weber. Delk just flings it toward the goal. They did it. Michigan is headed to Monday night's championship game. The Wolverines simply fabulous. Angie Fish hugging, and there's Weber with Bossard. It'll be Michigan and North Carolina on Monday night. So many said they couldn't do it, but Michigan has. They've advanced to the championship game, and the Chevrolet players of the game, Chris Weber from Michigan with 27 points, matching his season high, and Jamal Mashburn, his career closes out at Kentucky, 26 points. Everybody said you guys couldn't do it. You've proven everybody wrong. Well, not everybody. You picked us to be a one seed. You picked us to be here. And I think you picked us to get to the finals, So I did, in fact. Congratulations, Chris. How about a quick comment? Well, you know, I just thank God that our team played well and we held on. And uh, people were expecting them to blow us out, but we have a lot of heart. One thing about Michigan, you back us in the corner, we're going to come out fighting. All right, we're out of time. Jalen, great job today. We'll see you Monday night. They're all set. They'll be playing North Carolina here Monday night. So for Billy Packer. Pat O'Brown, Brian, James Brown, John Thompson, and Leslie Fisher. Jim Nance saying so long from the Superdome. We'll see you Monday night. It should be super. News continues with Bob Lobel at New England Sports. All right, welcome back, everybody. We'll deal with the uh, Celtics and Kevin McHale in just a second. But uh, today's news today, the Red Sox losing to the Oakland A's. Today, Andre Dawson had knee surgery today. Rehab, light rehab begins in about a week. He's been through this before. He'll be out four to six weeks. Meanwhile, the, uh, his teammates ending their seven-game homestand at four and three, dropping a 6-3 contest to Oakland today at Fenway. Fourth inning, Mark McGuire, who is one for 29 in his career against Clemens, blasts one out of the park, making it three to one. Sixth inning is when Clemens and the Sox have trouble. Ruben Sierra, a rope to right center field. Billy Hatcher can't come up with it. Brent Gates scores from first. Sierra gets a triple, and the game is tied at three all. Then with the bases loaded, one out. Kevin Seitzer bounces to first. John Valentin can't come up with it. Or bounces to third or short, rather. Valentin can't come up with it. And it's an error. Mark McGuire scores, making it four to three. It'll be five three in the eighth when McGuire takes Greg Harris deep to left, his second home run of the game, and a second two run home run against the Sox this year. The A's beat the Sox and Clemens six to three. Well, it was a struggle, and um, but you got to battle and try and work your way through it, and you know that's really the best I could do at that point. Uh, had an opportunity to get out a couple jams and where it could have gotten worse, but uh, they had a couple key hits. The ball's gotten a gap, and uh, it hurt. All right, let's talk about the C's. Last night's loss in Game Four to the Hornets was a perfect summation of the season past. There were the lows, the inconsistent play, the uh, tremendous high that come back in the fourth period. But in the end, the Celtics fell short, and they were eliminated by the young Charlotte Hornets. Scott Wally takes a look back at last night's heartbreaker and looks ahead to what will certainly be a tumultuous offseason. 
McHale threw a perfect pass to the basket. Brown skied to the rim. It was that close. The Celtics came that close to beating the Charlotte Hornets last night after trailing by as many as 19 points. The, the effort was tremendous at the end. And, uh, you know, we gave it everything we did and we had and we left it out there on the court and uh, it just, just wasn't enough. You know, we were close but no cigar. And so instead of handicapping game five, we are talking today about the end of a difficult season, the retirement of Kevin McHale, and the uncertain future of this basketball team. Things happen, and hopefully we can uh, regroup. It's going to be a long, young, long season for the Celtics because we got a lot of, a lot of rebuilding to do, a lot of things to do. For three quarters last night, the contest seemed an extension of Game Three. The Hornets were making all the plays; the Celtics were not. But in the fourth quarter, seemingly out of nowhere, came the comeback, and McHale was in the trenches with Parrish, just like the old days. Chris said, "You know, screw all the plays. This is only going to do one thing. We're going to jam it inside." And uh, that felt great. It really did. The Celtics were reaching back to the glory days once more. And when Sherman Douglas stole it from Larry Johnson and scored at the other end, the Celts had the lead, their first and only lead of the game. But three calamitous events in the final seconds left them in ruins. Rick Fox called for a 10-second violation as he crossed midcourt. Playing for the win, the Hornets worked it to Alonzo Mourning. All alone for the jumper is off. Swish with four tenths of a second left. To tell you the truth, uh, um, oh man, I'm speechless right now. But still, a fraction second remains the season. The Celtics tried the alley oop. Kendall Gill met D. Brown at the rim. No goaltending, no foul, horn sounds, game set and match. The call was there. Yeah, the play was there. Was the goaltending? Yeah, it was goaltending. Oh boy, well, we could have used that call at that time. You know, the goaltending or it looked like a little bit of contact, but. You know, it was fun. Chief, we're down to the big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not even thinking about it right now. You know. It's possible Robert Parrish may not be back next year, and we now know that Reggie Lewis may never play again. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot, of, a lot of things happening on this ball club, a lot of tragedies. But the Celtics must push on. They draft 19th, no guarantees there. The following had a list of players who may become unrestricted free agents. Smith, Norman, and Green are forwards, Dudley and Lang centers, Elo and Scott are guards. The Celtics may need one of each before they're done. In the end, there were simply too many obstacles for this basketball team to overcome, but Kevin McHale and his teammates went down fighting. The emotions on this final night of the season, frustration, disappointment, pride, and sadness. It was a difficult year, and, uh, but our guys still fought to the bitter end. But now we got to regroup and go on from here. In Charlotte, North Carolina, Scott Wall, ATV4 Sports. Last night, of course, was the final game Kevin McHale will play in a Celtics uniform after 13 great years. He made it official and retired last night. Bob Newmeyer takes a look at the career of one of the two Celtic greats. The Big Three has lost another charter member. First Lowry, now Kevin. I'm emotional now more than sad, I guess. It's tough, uh, it's tough doing something since I was for 13 years old. I've done it. Uh, it was so much fun when I was healthy and so hard when I wasn't. And it was fun for many years, playing on championship contenders with talented teammates in a sports crazed town. I'm so proud to have played my entire career in Boston. You know, that, 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 that and my number going up top are the two things I'm the proudest of. I was so fortunate to play with guys, starting with Tiny and Max and ML. And then, you know, Danny is such a great guy, such a great friend. And uh, Larry and Robert and, uh, you know, Reggie and, uh, and Bill Walton and Jerry Seasting and all the guys that we played with have made it so special to go through there. But like all professional athletes, relentless old father time would get the best of Kevin McHale. His feet hurt all the time. The spirit was willing. The body simply would not cooperate. I really lost my mental edge this year for the first time, and that was really frustrating. And I played so passively so many games because I was just afraid to get hurt, and I was tired of being hurt. I was tired of everything. And, you know, I said it, if I could try to, if I could generate the same energy I had in the playoff game, I'd come back and play another year, but I just don't think I can. And thus, Kevin will have ample time to sit back in his easy chair and reminisce about his magical moments, and there were many. But unlike Larry Bird, whose personal highlight reel features the routinely spectacular, McHale's will be a bogus board of his half dozen inside low post moves. Good enough for 20 to 25 points per game, every game. I've cried, I've been jubilant, I've been 
I've been I've been frustrated. I, I've been happy. I, I you do so many things in this jersey. And that's the hardest thing. You know, I'll, I'll never uh, put it on again and go out there and battle. And uh, but you know, there's a time for everything, and this is my time to step down. It would be a serious mistake for anyone to look at Kevin McHale's career as some kind of bit player to Bird's megastar status. Kevin McHale carved out his own niche, and together with Bird and Parrish, they would complement each other beautifully. Some people have always asked me how it was to play second fiddle to, uh, you know, to, to, to Robert or to Larry Bird. I tell you, uh, when you play second fiddle to Larry Bird, you still play a pretty mean fiddle. <laughs> oh, it's a great honor to play with someone like Kevin on and off the court. He's a hell of an athlete, obviously, and I think he's a great person also. You know, I just wish we could have uh, had a, a better effort, could have went further in the playoffs than, than we did, but I thought it was a great effort, you know, and Kevin has had a great career. And retirement is, is an issue that we all got to address, so uh, I wish Kevin the very best. After last night's game, Kevin McHale repeated just how sad it is to say goodbye. But no sadder for him than for his diehard fans, who have come to view Larry, he, and Robert as kind of next-door neighbors. Soon the McHale family will back in, load the van, and point it to Minnesota, where it began and where it will one day end. But what a middle this has been. Bob Newmeyer, TV4 Sports. All right, Numi, thank you very much. As the saying goes, you don't know what you have until it's gone. And then, uh, as Jack just pointed out while we're watching that story, I mean, we really didn't know how good we had it to have uh, those great players oh. here for that whole 13 years of that decade. Yeah. And now... Uh, they're gone, and now we know what we had. Yeah, it's time to rebuild. Yeah, what chief going to be forty next year? Right. I thought he had a great series anyway. And, hey, okay. Hey, thanks, Bob. That was an editorial. <laughs> <laughs> gonna shock the world. We're gonna shock the world when Tony T and T Tucker knocked out Lennox Lewis. Shock the world. It's all over then. There's another question here you over here. see here is the London Bridge. Come, come, come down. We're going to open up the floor now for questions from the press for Lennox Lewis. It looks like uh, Tony Tucker's the camp is being eaten a lot of pork because they got a pork eating dread in the corner. No, you, we got rhythm, brother. That's what you don't understand. We got rhythm. I don't know what you got in England, but over here we got rhythm. All the brothers get together. All we can do is add Charlie Steiner, who will be on hand covering the fight beginning with the weigh-in tomorrow evening on the Sports Center at 6, uh, 7 Eastern time. And, of course, uh, he'll have post-fight analysis with Al Bernstein Saturday evening. It was a boxing promoter who once said yesterday... Then his was grin gone. was the deal that brought Kevin McHale to Boston. After the picks were picked, it was Joe Barry Carroll and Ricky Brown for Robert Parrish and McHale. Those two Celtics combined with Larry Bird to win three championships and helped define the NBA's age of golden growth. The Bird era ended last summer. McHale's retirement came last night. He didn't miss much, whether it was a low post shot, a chance to turn a phrase, or important times with his family. The game changed his life, but it did not alter his priorities. What was more important, to be in New York that Christmas Eve before the double overtime loss, or to defy the league order, eat the fine, and spend Christmas morning with the kids before catching the shuttle? McHale had 14 rebounds and led Boston with 29 points that day, and the Celtics did go on to win the championship that season. He always knew where he stood. I tell you, uh, when you play second fiddle, Larry Bird, you still play a pretty mean fiddle. Because <laughs> Birdie was the best. Had he played in another town, McHale always said he would have scored more points, but had less fun. In 12 seasons, his face aged. The lines evidence of uncounted smiles and unseen post-practice skirmishes with his buddies. Everybody's gone and playing one-on-one -on -one with some guy or two-on-two -two and just having a good time. And Everybody's gone. No coaches, no media, no nothing. I'm just playing a game that I've played my whole life and loved. A bad ankle, then foot problems, brought pain to his playtime. McHale actually retired during training camp last fall. But priorities, his four kids, changed his plans to leave. I had quit. You know, I, I was in my mind. I was done. And the next day when I talked to Mikey and Joey, they were so, and Chris and Natasha, they were so disappointed they couldn't be ball boys and stuff. Made me feel guilty, so I, I strapped her up and went at it again. After a hesitant final season on faulty feet, McHale increased his contribution across the board in the playoffs, but the Celtics were eliminated in four. It wasn't the same game anyway, not to him. The good guys, bad guys battles had been supplanted by the era of mega-marketed player personalities. Maybe you get on a Wheaties box or something. I don't know. It just, it just...